The brain's power over diet is core to our survival. So powerful that scientists have tested it against one of the strongest human urges. They fitted volunteers with electrodes to record brain activity. Then they compared how our pleasure centers respond when we eat chocolate and when we kiss. Not surprisingly, when couples kissed, their pleasure centers reacted. But kissing couldn't touch the effect achieved when chocolate hit the tongue. That pleasure was more intense and lasted longer. Our obsession with eating makes perfect evolutionary sense. During most of human history, food has been scarce. That experience drives us to gorge when we can and store nutrients for survival. But even when food runs out completely, our brain has a response. The want center, buried at the brain's base, has instructions for beating starvation. This cell bundle saved a French cave explorer's life. He expected a one-day adventure underground. It became the greatest challenge he ever endured. Just above the spine is the human brain's most ancient part. The want center kept our ancestors alive when food ran out. Now, it's Jean-Luc Josois's only hope of escaping death. In animals, this part of the brain evolved around the time of the dinosaurs, before mammals existed. It's hardwired to beat starvation. For three days, Jean-Luc has been trapped underground. He hasn't had a morsel to eat. He doesn't know it, but his brain is changing how his body functions and how he behaves. There are a couple of different brain centers that regulate feeding behavior as well as hunger. They're in different parts of the central part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And in that part of the brain, you're really driven to seek out food, to eat almost anything, to try to stop yourself from starving to death. To drive Jean-Luc's search for food, his brain first releases a hormone, orexin. Orexin comes in tiny doses, but it has a profound effect. This hormone makes us more alert, improves our muscle efficiency, making us better hunters. It even sharpens our problem-solving skills. For days, Jean-Luc scours the caves. water, but nothing to eat. He starts to fear the worst. Even if, when I had a little hope, I thought obsessively what would happen over the last few days, or the last hours before dying. It was a big question. How I would die? Was it going to be cold or hunger? Or It was a question that I always had in my head. Sure that he's doomed, he records a message. But as hope fades, Jean-Luc's brain switches strategy to help him survive with no food. With his fuel stores depleted, his body becomes even more efficient. It makes him slow down. Now, his muscles use less energy. So do all his internal organs. New cells grow more slowly. Non-essentials, fingernails, toenails, hair, hardly grow at all. Jean-Luc is entering a survival state that evolved to keep starving animals alive until they could get to food. This enforced efficiency, which kicks in when we're at our limit, may have bigger implications. Some say it could help us all live longer. In a recent trial, 
Researchers compared semi-starved rats to those fed a normal diet. Surprisingly, the less the rats ate, the longer they lived. Some animals' lifespans doubled. Based on these findings, some people drastically cut their food intake, hoping to live longer. The average American adult consumes almost 4,000 calories a day. Brian Delaney eats half that. He's trying to fool his brain into staying in super efficient starvation mode. Right now, I take in about 1,950 calories per day. At the most strict, I was eating about 1,650 calories per day. If the theory holds, this could slow the aging process. It seems to work. When people who slash their caloric intake were compared with normal eaters, the dieters' hearts resembled those of much younger people. The heart is actually rejuvenated by 10 or 15 years. We know that calorie restriction does slow aging and in some respects even reverse it in humans. Reducing food intake may help people like Brian live longer. Right now, a starved brain is keeping Jean-Luc Josua alive. But he's gone three weeks without food, more than even his slowed metabolism can stand. Jean-Luc's brain adopts a final desperate plan. His brain orders Jean-Luc's body to eat itself. A hormone from his brain signals his liver, triggering the release of chemicals. These chemicals have already broken down body fat. Now, they start ripping apart protein, Jean-Luc's muscles, a last-ditch source of energy. So a typical non-obese individual would have 130,000 to 160,000 calories stored as fat, only about 54,000 calories stored in muscle, and only half of that 54,000 calories is available for energy because once you've lost half of the protein in your body, it's no longer compatible with life. Simply speaking, when your body consumes half your muscle cells, the game is up. But a brain desperate for fuel holds nothing sacred. It will even sanction burning heart muscle to keep itself going. So you have to start eating the protein in your body, literally eating it up to produce the sugar that's needed by the brain and the red blood cell. Miraculously for Jean-Luc, his brain's high-risk strategy pays off. 35 days after he was trapped, searchers find him only 200 yards from the cave mouth. His ordeal cost him over 40 pounds in fat and muscle, but his brain is just fine. Now that I look back at it, I think that everyone has a survival instinct, but it's just when one faces a situation like this that one really discovers it. The brain works flat out at all times, digesting reams of information, and never more than during a NASCAR race. The brain manages thousands of systems that keep us alive. And it has to do that faster than any computer could. Processing an astonishing 100 trillion instructions every second. As any central processing unit does, the brain produces heat. Without cooling, our brain would overheat, its internal temperatures rising one degree every five minutes. Ten minutes without cooling causes disorientation. Twenty minutes can do permanent damage. And after 50 minutes, if the brain is 10 degrees too hot, you're dead. 
because our brain manages everything else, its main duty is to protect itself. Few settings test the brain's cooling system more than the blast furnace world of a stock car race. A split second hesitation can cost you the race. So staying cool is key to keep your, you know, your brain cool and, and your blood cool. You know, it's no different than the engines, you know, in our race cars. If we don't keep them cool, they overheat and they'll blow up eventually and you'll be out of the race. We won't blow up, but we don't run good when we're hot. The drivers are ready for 400 laps of white knuckle all-out speed. On the track, the temperature already runs past 100 degrees. Inside those 850 horsepower beasts, it's even hotter. Driver's working in the strenuous environment. He's generating heat himself just through the exercise of steering and braking and all that. But then you have the added thing of the exhaust pipes generating heat into the forepit. So typically we see cockpit temperatures 125 to 140 degrees. In such extremes, our brain needs sophisticated ways to stay cool. Our body's cooling system works like a car's. We've got an, a radiator system which basically cools the water that's circulated through the engine. you got airflow which comes in the front of the car and circulates through the core of the radiator and you have airflow that then goes over the top of the castings and the rest of the engine to help cool it by air. car cools itself with water. The brain uses blood, which carries heat to the skin surface. As sweat evaporates, it cools the blood. The forehead and face are the best sites for cooling. They have many sweat glands and air can get at them. NASCAR drivers have fresh air piped through their helmets to enhance the cooling effect. The rest of the body is harder to cool. So if you're in a situation, say, driving a racing car, you have to wear protective clothing that's going to protect you in a crash or you're in a fire. Sweating in that situation is not really going to help you because it's just going to be absorbed into the clothing. Eventually, the surface of the clothing will, will be wet and that'll evaporate. As the laps roar by, sweat saturates the driver's suits. This keeps perspiration from evaporating. But even after 210 laps, when the car's interiors are baking hot, the drivers must still perform at their peak. Out there on a racetrack, you're, you're looking literally, hitting your mark within six inches, you know, sometimes every time. Every time you go off in a corner at 200 miles an hour. So you really have to be focused on hitting your marks on the racetrack. And, and you can't do that if you're focused on, you know, how hot you are. We still don't know exactly how our brain maintains the correct temperature under such conditions. One controversial theory says it has an extra cooling method. The brain is such an important organ that there are various um, capabilities and facilities there to try and maintain its normal internal environment. There are those that would argue that we have a special system that allows us to have selective brain cooling. On the way to the heart, blood cooled by a sweating face and forehead runs close to arteries feeding the head. That lowers the temperature of blood bound for the brain. Considering the brain's 10,000 plus miles of blood vessels, this may be how the core stays at optimum temperature. After five hours and 600 miles, the drivers cross the line, still 100% focused. They can do that thanks to the brain's astonishing ability to stay cool, even in the swelter of a NASCAR race.